Hello and welcome to another Kairos Conversation. My name is Joshua Pfeiffer and I'm here today with my very dear friend, <laughs> Joanna Hensley. Joanna, welcome to Kairos. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> um, so Joanna is here today to talk to her, us about her journey as a Christian parent with a special needs child. It's a bit more of a personal topic and so Joanna, we really appreciate your willingness well, to come on and talk about this today. It's a pleasure. I have my stack of hankies just in case. <laughs> Um, so, Joanna, perhaps you can begin by just telling us a little bit um, about your child with special needs. Yeah, so um, our 12-year-old son, our firstborn son, Sam, has uh, special needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, his particular challenges are um, language disorders and then also um, autism spectrum disorder not the high-functioning kind. So the, the technical words for these things are you know, social pragmatic communication disorder and then, of course, autism spectrum disorder. Mm, okay. And so um, you he's your firstborn, as mm. you said, and so you came into uh, the birth of your first child, I guess, without much to compare things to. And, and so when did you first realize um, that there was something different about Sammy? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think for me, I did sense some differences even in infancy, even from those early, early days. Really? Mm. But you're right, since he was my firstborn, I had nothing to compare that with. So mm. I didn't know how much of it was him, how much of it was me, my mm. own inexperience as a mother. I thought I knew everything about kids, as you always do before you have children. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I, I think I started sensing a few things, even in infancy. But you know, those missed milestones, mm. the, um, the, the talking that doesn't happen. Mm. And, and, every, and, and so many parents um, worry about these milestones mm. not being met, but then try to reassure each other. You know, I'm sure everyone says it'll all come normally. Right, the right, right, and... until it doesn't. Right. And I think that that's a really lovely thing for people to say to one another, mm. that it's all going to be all right. And and, uh, you know, he'll start talking eventually kind of thing. He'll probably start talking in complete hmm. sentences. I hmm. heard that a lot. Yeah. But, you know, when that doesn't happen yeah. and those milestones either are missed or, or hit in, in odd ways, I mean, that's when you really start to, to hmm. see that there's an issue. Hmm. And, and uh, oh, boy, those were not easy times. Yeah, so this is in, in the first, or in the first few years? Of yeah, so thinking, definitely. Yeah. So, you know... Babies, they learn how to, to talk within the first couple years of, yeah. of life usually. But by the time, you know, he's pushing three years old, he's not saying mama. He's right. not saying dada. Like we were so excited when mm. he would say pop when we were playing mm. with bubbles. I mean, it was mm. that sort of thing where, oh, mm. it's just not happening. Mm. And, and you, you hesitate to want to label him with some kind of disability and you, you, you kind of have this sense of never giving up on your child and never wanting to, to, to go down that path but at the same time that was just our reality. You know, mm. he, there was an issue there. And so was there a particular moment you can look back to when you actually first got a, a diagnosis or something like that? Yes. So around about that time, you know, the doctors, the pediatricians start to send you to specialists. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a really rough time because you, well, we would meet with different doctors and different uh, neurologists and pediatricians and developmentalists and psychologists, you know, just the whole gamut, really. Yeah. And you know, people would say really helpful things like, have you tried speaking with a child? <laughs> yeah. oh, I just, never thought of that. Oh, yeah. oh I'm supposed to do that. Yeah. Well, that just broke my heart yeah. repeatedly because yeah. so much of that, um, of course, maybe being a first-time mom, but I think any mom is going to think, I have failed my child because every other mom is getting their baby to say mama and dada mm. and all these early words, but I'm not. Mm. So what's wrong with me? Why can't I get my child to talk? And, and then, of course, other behaviors that start to unfold that make you think more about the autism. But for us, language was the first challenge and yeah. still is, I think, the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, and it, I'm not sure how clearly you remember all of the emotions and experience of that time, and, but you've begun to touch on some of it by talking or alluding to, to feelings of guilt there yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, and so can you remember much about 
how that affected you, and particularly for you and your husband, your faith at that time? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just speak for me because mm. my husband can speak for himself because I think we both did have slightly different journeys when it came mm. to you know, how we accepted it, how we mourned what was happening, um, you know, that issue of mourning. Like, I, I, I never would have come across as saying that I'm that I'm overly sad about having a special needs mm. child because just from the get-go, I'll tell you, I love him to pieces. Mm. I'd have him no other way. If somebody could wave a magic wand over him and take all this away, I'm not sure I would choose that, you know? Mm. I just really love our Sam. But I will say that there were some some dreams that I had for what my early motherhood experience would be like. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of systematically dashed, right? Mm -hmm. All of those expectations or assumptions even that, that I had about parenting and children, just to see one by one these ideals toppling, mm -hmm. that was just hard to take. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, my faith, I think, only grew through that experience. Okay. I mean, I definitely had moments where you know, for example, and not to talk about potty training too much, but look, when you talk <laughs> about moms and, and early childhood, you have to talk about it, right? Um, you know, we were on, say, year three of the potty training journey. It was a long, long yeah. one that um, I remember thinking, God, you can, with a word, create the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And yet, you can't just make this happen for my child. Mm -hmm. You can't just sort of make him use the toilet and those sort of So, I mean, there were definitely those times, but I don't think that that was, um, that, uh, that wasn't where it ended. Mm. I think through the experience and even now, it's only ever deepened my faith. Okay. And so you we've talked mainly about the early years then, and mm. as Sammy started to um, grow and, um, and get into those ages between, say, well, he's how old? 12 he's 12 now, now yep. So between you know, 5 and, and 10 or so, mm. um, what sorts of other challenges popped up for you along this journey with him? And, um, and, and overall, um, what sorts of big themes come to mind in this, this journey for you that perhaps um, overlap with other people that have special needs kids as well? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting that you talk about the overlap because every child with special needs is unique and mm. their families every single one of them is unique and so whatever it is that I'm saying can only be understood as as my perspective and my experience and I welcome other special needs parents I don't know if there's a comment feature to this Kairos Indeed, yes. podcast <laughs> but but definitely comment with your experiences too so that we can all learn from each other but yeah I, I would have to say some of the major challenges um, uh, well having a conversation or being able to express your needs um, you know, I want an apple instead of <laughs> instead of just saying that it's a total meltdown because mm. he doesn't. You know, it, it wasn't able to express in words the sorts of things that I was used to hearing in words. So we really had to learn how to communicate with each other in a new way. And I think we have. I think you know we've made a lot of gains there. Um, he's not completely nonverbal, so he is able. I think now that he's twelve to to communicate more clearly than mm. he ever has before. Um, but no, that's definitely hard. Um, also just behaviors, social situations, um, things that I might have assumed would be okay turn out not to be okay. Um, you know, thinking that, you know, oh, a, a trip to the zoo, of course, a boy would love such a thing. Oh, no, that was a big mistake on that particular day. But that sort of compounded times 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm. Oh, it's just so unpredictable. Mm. And so that I think the unpredictability of it is our particular challenge because I don't know, even now, after studying him so carefully for 12 years, I don't always know what's going to set him off yeah. or I don't always know how to interpret his needs. And, and so I'm, I feel like um, that's an ongoing challenge mm. for all of us in our family is just to love Sammy in a way that he knows that we love him and and to challenge him without pushing him over the edge but also expose him to as many opportunities as possible because social opportunities are hard friendships are hard um, new places are hard anything new is hard mm -hmm. um, 
But again, I'm not focusing on those hard things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you, so he, like I, as you say, Sammy can communicate now. Yeah. Um, was there a was there a point where early on where that was uh, it was possible he was never going to be able to communicate? Um, and when 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 did the progress begin to happen? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I, I don't know that we ever thought he would never get there. Mm. Um, but it was always sort of like. Uh, do people think he's never going to get there, but they're just not telling me because they don't want to break my yeah, heart or yeah. something like that? But honestly, um, he's had some fantastic speech therapists. Mm -hmm. uh, he's had, um, we, we homeschool him, which has been such a good decision. Mm -hmm. I think what really opened the door of language for him was when we taught him at home how to read. And once he was, because most people learn how to talk and then learn how to read, right? Mm. For him, the reading came first, and he was, and, and we took a very grammatical approach to this. I'm talking subject nouns, verbs, mm. direct objects. We talked, you know, I, I sort school. of got this. That's right. Mm. Did it old school. <laughs> but once he understood the building blocks of language grammatically, oh, that was the best thing for him because mm. it helped him then to put those variables into language. So once he understood, oh, it goes subject, noun, verb, direct, object. I can do that. So now he says, you know, I want an apple or, or um, you know, he took my Lego. Like whatever it is, he can get those structures down and the structure is what made him, I think, mm. take off verbally. Mm -hmm. You mentioned as well these situations where um, there could be unpredictable behaviours in social situations that mm -hmm. were challenging. Um, as, a, as a Christian parent, it makes me wonder too how the journey in church communities has been along the way. Did those right. unpredictable uh, behaviours manifest also at church and what was that like? Yeah, and definitely, definitely. So we've had really good experiences in all the congregations that we've been a part of. I will say if at any point anyone did not welcome Sammy, we would not stay at that congregation for long. And uh, I say that because there are sad stories that you hear from just being in the special needs community. You know, you hear from other parents who say, you know, their child was kicked out of Sunday school mm -hmm. because of behaviors mm -hmm. or, um, you know, someone maybe you know, asked that person, you know, that person who was maybe moaning or making some vocalizations during the service to leave because they might put off visitors or, or something yeah. like this. I mean, you hear, I'm, yeah. I'm sure everybody has heard of, of times where people with special needs who have especially the, the, that social awkwardness, for lack of a better word, you know, they just aren't fitting in. And, and so sometimes they're, they're asked to leave. But that has not happened at mm. any of our congregations. I'm very thankful for that. Praise the Lord. Joanna goes to my congregation, so I'm especially happy to hear that. Our pastors are especially good with our... <laughs> yeah, I wasn't fishing for compliments. Um, and you talked about some of the uh, big challenges along the way, um, and I'm sure there's many, many more that you may want to talk about. I'm also interested whether there's been any unexpected joys along the way. Oh, absolutely. Look, every day brings an unexpected joy. Okay. And I, I'm not exaggerating every day brings an unexpected mm. joy. And I think about how, um, you know, with my neurotypical children, they do things that I might assume that every child will do. And, and I'll be quite proud of them too. But like when Sammy mm. does something, it's like my heart explodes with <laughs> happiness. So for example, uh, just Lately, you know, the kids are in swimming lessons. Well, this year, Sammy was in, his, in a class for swimming lessons, not private lessons as he's done in the past, but actually joined in a class, and he's waiting his turn before going, and he's listening for instructions from his swimming teacher, that sort of thing. I was so proud, mm. and I know that there are thousands of kids that go to swimming lessons, and nobody even necessarily thinks about it, but yeah. that's one of my unexpected joys is that, Every day he surprises me by being able to do more and more things, and I'm really proud of that. Um, I'd say another unexpected joy would be the people I've met. Hmm. Like, it is not unusual for me to meet a complete stranger on the road or 
who has a special needs child, we share our experiences and mm. just within moments we're crying with each other and hugging each other and you know, it's it's like an, an instant bond, and it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I I would not have met so many of the people that I truly, truly admire if, if, without Sammy in my life. Because mm -hmm. I think my eyes would have just been closed. I wouldn't know about this this um, sort of community within a community. And it's just been lovely the way uh, it crosses over. You know boundaries, yep. whatever they are. You know, breaks down. Yeah, it breaks down, yeah. There and, and you can instantly understand each other. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, th and thanks for that. And thanks, th just as you were talking about the unexpected joys of, of these accomplishments, these breakthroughs that Sammy has that are, um, are all the more joyful because of the challenges mm. preceding that, it also it makes me think of some of our time here with Sammy and the congregation too, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Oh, but we had the opportunity to um, have Samuel's first communion mm. here, and I think for me pastorally that was a, a little bit similar in that it's hard for me to remember a more um, joyful first communion oh, yeah. actually because we had no idea what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. you know? We just didn't know where to start, how it was going to go, That's how it was right. going to go, and even on the day itself there was a few hiccups and whatnot, yep. but. But we got there in the end, and um, yeah. man, it was really something special. Uh, and I hadn't thought about it quite in those terms until you were just talking. Then. Yeah, no, that's a day I will, I will treasure for the rest mm. of my, for not just for the rest of my life, but for all of eternity. I'm going to treasure mm. Sammy's first communion, and and oh, I, I think need the hanky, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if if that had just turned out normal, I, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish a neurotypical child's first <laughs> communion like that. I'm not trying to diminish anything, but just to see just what that journey was for him mm. and how he genuinely values the Lord's Supper yeah, and genuinely um, hungers for it. And on those days when we have matins, he's sort of like, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Don't, uh, surely we're having Lord's Supper, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, he he has a he has a genuine. It's hard to think of anyone who has a, a stronger desire actually in yeah. some of the way that manifests. No, that's for him. right. That's right. Yeah, um, and so you we've begun to talk about um, I guess in bits and pieces different ways in which your Christian faith has sort of interacted with this journey and perhaps mm. helped you along that journey. Do other things come to mind for you about um, your Christian faith and having a special needs child? Yeah, you know I. Um I had to smile when you were asking me about this interview. You had said something like, is it okay for us to use his name? Mm. And I definitely want to talk about his name because I can't think about my son Samuel without thinking about Samuel from the Old Testament. Okay. And, and this is something that I wasn't necessarily... Well, I mean, I, I was thinking about this when I was thinking about what should I name my baby someday. But, yeah. but I guess just reflecting on this after Sammy's been born and, you know, Hannah... Samuel of the Old Testament's mother, how she prayed for this child, and she prayed a long time for this child. And I feel like I also prayed a long time for Sammy to come along. And when he did come along, Hannah says, now I give him to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And same with me. Like, I want to have my baby. I want to give him to the Lord. And Samuel became God's servant. And I want my Samuel to be God's servant, right? I want God to use him because I've given him to the Lord. And I don't know what that exactly means or why God decided to do what he is particularly doing in Samuel's life. Mm -hmm. But there's no doubt in my mind that he is using Sam because he knows that Sam is his. His, mm -hmm. his child in baptism, his, his, his servant... He's using Sammy according to his will. And mm. even though that seems strange to me, the way God has taken us down this particular path, look, I praise God for it because it's beyond what I can understand. But nevertheless, I give him to the Lord. And the other thing is, um, th just thinking about the Samuel image, I always love the part uh, in, in Samuel's story in his boyhood, how he's resting in the house of the Lord. And I, this is something I want for all my kids and all kids ever, you know, everywhere, um, to be able to rest in the house of the Lord mm -hmm. and to think about how, how Sam really does look at church that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, this is one of his safe places. Mm -hmm. And there are other places that we go to 
out in the big wide world where he doesn't have that same sense of rest. Mm. How thankful I am that he is at rest in the house of the Lord, nor has it always been this way. I mean, we've had a lot of struggles in church. I'm not mm. trying to um, say we haven't, but here I'm thankful for God, thankful to God that he has made a place in the church family for even Sammy mm. and that Sammy is now at rest in the house of the Lord. And that's wonderful to watch. Yeah, no, it is. I also, I know, Joanna, that you've also, um, I guess, dabbled, more than dabbled in, in, in theology along your, your journey. Yeah. And, and so um, from, from Lutheran theology in particular, is there anything that comes to mind that has been a particular help for you? Yes. So I, we've been talking about baptism and Lord's Supper, mm. so I'll probably just start there briefly that God has made Sammy his child in baptism and that God is present with Sammy in the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Oh, what else do I want for any of my children? Yeah. I mean, that just, that's the whole story. Yeah. That, uh, oh, what else do I need, right? And again, this came, you know, I remember this coming into fairly clear focus when we're talking about First Communion because mm. as soon as you begin looking too, too much inward and trying to work out exactly what is the level of um, comprehension right. of the faith, intensity right. of faith, mm -hmm. how does this all work in his situation, um, you're, really, you're really in pretty shady sort of no, territory, that's right. whereas we're talking about the objectivity of he is Christ for mm. him and mm -hmm. to receive that in faith is, is the main emphasis and no, um, it's right. a real joy. No, that's right. I'd also talk about um, the theology of the cross. You know, this idea that, that Jesus doesn't take away our suffering, but that Jesus suffers with us and that we don't just suddenly become valuable when we do successful things, but that we have a value, having been made in the image of God, that, that's our value. And that, I think that's true whether you're an unborn child in the womb or someone at end of life or you know, someone with dementia or I mean you, you can name it. I think with special needs children there's a value there that isn't based on what they're able to accomplish or how, how clever they might be at a particular task. Mm -hmm. And I, to, to illustrate this I guess um, you know Einstein we, People with late talking children always talk about Einstein because you know okay. he didn't talk till he was five, and then he is super smart and made a bomb, and he's just amazing. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I was like, well, look, Einstein did not become valuable mm. when he was this amazing scientist. He was valuable back when he was a child that wasn't speaking, you mm, know, and, mm. uh, and uh, you, you get this sense of, of, of um, I don't know what Sammy's going to do in his life. I think he does have some tremendous um, gifts to share with the world, but it's not, that's not what makes him valuable. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as theologians of glory, which I, we naturally are, we want our kids to be successful. We want these, but yet to be reminded that, no, I'd rather him be at the foot of the cross. I'd rather I'm at the foot of the cross uh, and that I'm not this whiz bang, great, amazing mom because my son is a starting quarterback. Uh, I'm, I'm just glad. <laughs> I'm just glad that we can be at the foot of the cross. Yeah. So that, that would be one of the Lutheran things. Look, I've got more to say, though. I, I've written <laughs> this down because I don't want to forget. Um, Are you good? Oh, like in your sermon this morning, <laughs> talking about Anna, the prophetess, yes. and how you're talking about how she was, you know, this old lady, a widow. Um, Nothing about her would have been considered, from the world's perspective, remarkable. Mm, mm. Just like I think with special needs kids, yep. the world doesn't see anything particularly remarkable about yep. them. But that doesn't stop God from using them for His purposes. Yep, and you see, you see Anna. I mean, any number of people who might be seen as the most unlikely ones to to be God's servant. And yet, I come back to that that um, that. Understanding that oh, Samuel, my Samuel, is God's child, and yeah. he's been baptized, and and God is going to use him according to his yeah. purposes. Yeah. God he works through suffering and brings brings mm. blessing even even through the cross is is no, just an sure. amazing thing. And I think of um, when I had the opportunity to work at a school with special needs kids 
once upon a time in another country and mm. and I was one of these volunteers who you know go there thinking of course that they have something to offer and all that right. sort of thing as a young person you come from all over the world Scandinavians there and all this sort of thing and I, I cannot remember one person that didn't leave that place saying um, I've received more okay. than I've given it's yeah. just every single person that yeah. I remember um, and I think it's it's for me at least a little glimpse of God. This is what God actually does, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and there's actually real stuff happening yeah. through these people spiritually. Oh, absolutely. Them. Well, doesn't that tie in with the speaking of Lutheran doctrines? That this idea of vocation. Mm. So, sometimes with special needs kids, you know, they receive so many services. You don't always think of them as giving services mm. to other people, but they absolutely in in whatever you know ability they are able. They can love and serve their neighbors. And like what you're describing, how everyone is taking, you know, gaining so much from this experience with these special needs kids, I would say the same thing is, is absolutely true in our family. Mm -hmm. I know that he's certainly taught me things and, and just expanded my sense of compassion and patience and um, just being on the lookout for, for other people that might be marginalized. Again, that's not finished in me. I still have much to learn. But Sammy is in my life, and he's making me a far better person than I was without him in my life. And for that, again, I praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm truly thankful that I have that special needs child because I, I almost uh, shudder to think what I was like before he came along. Right. Yeah. And you got any more notes on your Lutheran well, list? I do. I love being a Lutheran. So this question about like this Lutheran stuff, this is all I want to talk about. Um, I also wanted to say a word about the liturgy. Hmm. So we're so thankful for our congregation here at Bethlehem that uh, uses the liturgy from, from the hymnal. Uh, again, I'm not speaking on behalf of all special hmm. needs hmm. people everywhere, but for us, the fact that it's orderly, predictable, um, no flashing lights or loud drum beats, no offense to anybody, I don't want to say anything wrong, but um, that's really helpful for him. Mm. It's helpful for all of us because he sort of sees that predictability, he knows where it's going, he knows what stage we're at, he, you know, he'll notice if anything is missing mm. or in a different order, mm. like how we did the creed with the baptisms. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those are little things like, oh, okay, yeah. I'm okay, I can coast with this. But yeah, I'm just so thankful for, for the liturgy and for the content of the faith that that has taught to Sammy. Because sometimes, I think all, this is true for all of us, but especially with special needs children, especially if they have a language disorder, you know, you have to say things so many times. You have to be so repetitive for it to sink in. Mm -hmm. And that's just what the liturgy is for him. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember there was a phase of about three years where he absolutely hated any kind of singing. Like, happy birthday was the worst. If you <laughs> sang happy birthday, oh, he, it would take a couple of days for all of us to recover from that meltdown, bless his heart. Wow. And, um, and with as many kids as I have, we sing happy birthday a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, in that same phase, where he hated happy birthday and any kind of childish sing song, he loved to sing, thank the Lord and sing his praise, tell mm -hmm. everyone what he is. That, this is something that we sing at mm -hmm. a church in America. So it was just so interesting to me to see how he had this feeling, this, this understanding where the sacred music was acceptable to him, but this other music was decidedly not. Mm. And, and um, again, just so thankful that he didn't prefer happy birthday because even though that would have saved me so many socially awkward moments yeah. during those years and years of him hating that song, I would rather him say, thank the Lord mm. and right. sing his praise. Are you kidding me? Mm. That's what I want from my son. Mm. Oh, happy birthday can mm. come later. <laughs> and it has. Excellent. Uh, um, so some people who have special needs kids, they go through really hard times and um, it, it's sometimes hard for them to see, as you've alluded to earlier, what this looks like into the future. Mm. Um, and I think even really hard times is there hope for my child. You've alluded to some of these sorts of yeah. feelings along the way. So mm. what, what gives you hope for the future for, for Sammy? Hmm. You know, hope for the future, I'd have to say 
the future is my hope, like heaven, eternity, the new Jerusalem, that kind of future. Because I think about how I'm not going to live forever. You know, we always have that concern of what happens after whoever is the primary caregiver, you know, passes on and what's Mm. going to happen. Um, I do, I guess, worry isn't the right word. It's more like, I wonder what's going to happen then. Mm. It's just, yeah. You just can't see it. I it's can't impossible. see yeah. it. Yeah. But then I also know God can see it. Mm. He's got it sorted. And what I know for sure is that I'm looking at spending eternity in the New Jerusalem with my son, who at that point is not going to have these disabilities. Mm. I'd be healed from that. And even more exciting than the idea of knowing what my son is like without autism is to know what I'm going to be like when I don't have all of the sinfulness about me that's keeping me from being a perfect mom for Sammy. Mm. So I I feel like Sammy and I will will get up to heaven and have that moment of like, oh, that's who you are. But again, it's not just me saying, oh, now I have a son without autism. He's going to say, now I have a mom without sin that's Mm -hmm. keeping her from being what I need her to be. Mm-hmm. So, I, look, and, yeah, exactly. Mm, mm. But I'm in, I'm in it for the long haul, Josh. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to pretend that this world is where we're ever going to have that kind of success. Mm. Well, different special needs kids can do different things. I'm not trying to put a ceiling on him or mm. not have expectations of him. But just that idea that, that I'm in it for eternity. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's where my hope is. Mm. Well, that's a wonderful witness, and thank thank you for sharing that. We talked earlier about uh, the episodes within church communities and communion and the liturgy and these sorts of things. Um, I'm thinking now from from our perspective, for those without special needs kids in a in a congregation, is there any advice you could give to people like us as to how to serve a family like yours? Yeah, definitely. You know, just yesterday, last night. I read an article about, um, it, there was a study about church attendance for families with special needs kids. Hmm. And in this, this particular study, they found that it is specifically those children that have social challenges. So maybe not so much um, intellectual disability or you know, epilepsy or blindness or something like that, although those are still yep. important yep. things to think about. This particular article that I read I was just talking about how, how those social expectations of church are what keep families with special needs mm-hmm. kids from going to church. And I think that anyone would understand it, um, even with my neurotypical children, um, the idea of getting a child to sit still for an hour, look, <laughs> that can terrify any parent. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that, that we should all accept a circus mm-hmm. in divine service. That's not what I want at all. But, um, you know, maybe just lighten up a bit and not care so much mm-hmm. if a child does scream out during the service mm-hmm. or, um, or to be able to come to, to a, a mom or dad and say, Look, thank you for bringing your children to church. Mm-hmm. You don't need to comment on whether their behavior was good or bad. Or it, just don't talk, don't talk about the behavior. Mm-hmm. To say, I'm glad to see you. Mm. Um, I, I, think, I think also just asking that family how they can be of service to them. Because I know so, there's different ideas about things, like having a sensory room in the back or yeah, something like yeah. this. Like That just for us would cause more harm than good. But mm-hmm. for another family, that might be something mm-hmm. that they would be interested in. So just talking to that family specifically about what they need. Um, but, but I just want to thank the ladies who volunteer for morning tea who don't fuss at him for taking too many cookies. Off of the, <laughs> because I know he does. We're working on that, by the way. We're working on that. But you know, that's the difference between him shooting out to the car and coming into Bethlehem yeah. House for morning tea is, you know, well, are they going to fuss at me if yeah, I take too yeah, many biscuits? Yeah, yeah. And wouldn't you rather him take too many biscuits yeah. And be part of the community, mm. than you know, be sort of exiled 
just, it's just over something that doesn't really matter that much to begin with. And actually, I, and for all, I've seen both with Sammy and with other kids, I've seen these sort of negative things that we've talked about. But one of the great joys in my ministry has been seeing just how patient people mm. can and tolerant people actually Absolutely. can be. Absolutely. Uh, and, and they just they just do overlook all sorts of things because yeah. I think at, at the bottom of it for, for most Christian people in my experience is they just love for the mm. kids to be there. Even yeah. even if sometimes they find this difficult, they're still behind that even. They know they, right. they love them to be there. And, yeah, no, that's um, right. And and that's like what I say. We've had such good experiences with, you know, people taking the time to, to smile and listen mm. as Sammy goes on and on and on about the Titanic or mm. some animal that he's studying or, or something like that. Again, for you know, three months running, it's the same monologue. But you know, they're they're making him feel like this is a safe place for him. Mm. That's so valuable mm. to us as a family. And I, I also think about ways that um, you know, maybe just supporting the entire family, not just focusing on the child with the special needs, but but what can you do to? To, to lift up the siblings. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not easy to be a brother or a sister of yeah. somebody with special needs. And I can think about you know, friends from church. Well, this morning, you know, one of the ladies I know from church came and held the baby. Yes. And I sang the last hymn completely <laughs> uninter uninterrupted. And it was a fantastic hymn. Yeah. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I thought, what a blessing that was yeah. just to have her hold the baby. Yeah. Or um, I have another friend from church who, who comes and sits with my, with my other children at home while I take Sammy to do his special um, math lesson. Mm. So it's kind of like, um, you know, maybe they're not able to help the special needs kid, yeah. but they can help the ones who, who don't have to go to a therapy appointment or don't have to be dragged along. Because special needs kids' siblings, they get dragged along to a lot of mm -hmm. things much more fun to stay at home with, with a you know a friend from church who mm. who has that sort of heart to give, and um, I think about another friend from church who gave our family passes to an animal park. You know, yeah. just those sorts of things mean the world to us yeah. because it it lifts up everybody. Sammy loved that so much he wanted to go there for his birthday. So, I mean, just that sort of thing. And sing happy birthday. <laughs> we can do that now, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, but, but, yeah, just those sorts of things, it just lifts up the whole family. And the more you can kind of lift up everybody and support one another and show each other, it, it's, it's just being human with each other. Mm. Maybe overlooking that, helping with this, you know, genuinely can, being concerned and, and, and um, talking to, to the people about what their needs are. That, that's really, I think, what it takes. Mm. And so there's someone out there watching who themselves has a child with special needs. Any mm. last words to them? Any, any advice? Or, um... Oh, gee, I'm, I'm the last one to give any <laughs> advice, but I would probably just encourage you that you're not alone, that God has you and your child, and he's got plans for you both, and they're plans to benefit you. And it is hard, and it is heartbreaking, and I'm not going to pretend it isn't. But we don't just live for this life. We've got a hope and a future that's beyond anything that we can imagine. Mm. Well, you're all, you, you, you're going to make it through without me. I'm going to make you. it through. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna, it's just been a real delight um, talking to you today, and we really thank you for your openness in discussing what's a fairly personal sort of topic, and mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that many people will be blessed by having the opportunity Aww. to hear this conversation. So thanks again. God bless you and Sammy and the rest of the family. Aww, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Okay, and so we're back for the bonus lightning round now with Joanna. Joanna, you're a good sport. Thanks for entertaining these questions as well. Okay. Number one, Joanna, if you were an animal, what would you be and why? A snowy owl because snow is mm -hmm. great. 
And so where are you from? Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. On Wisconsin. It forward. Snow it snows there a little bit more than Adelaide, bit right? bit more, yeah. <laughs> Especially <laughs> at Christmas time. Yeah, I know. It's not quite, not quite the same. Mm -hmm. we, we still sing about white Christmases in the supermarket for some <laughs> reason, and I don't get it. But favorite place in the world and why? That's a very difficult one to ask somebody who is an immigrant, mm. such as myself. I would have to say, oh, anywhere where Adam Hensley is, <laughs> that's my husband. I love him. Lovely. Very <laughs> good. That's a good answer. So you have to sing karaoke. What song do you pick? Oh, maybe I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Mm. I've only ever sung karaoke once, and I sang... I'm proud to be an Oki from Muskogee. Okay, is that a place in Wisconsin? At uh, Oklahoma, okay. my other state that I have family in. So. Very good. What's a book that we should all read that we probably haven't? That we probably haven't. That's the hard part of the question, isn't it? Um, I would say Jane Austen's Persuasion, hmm. because Everybody reads Jane Austen's more mm -hmm. sort of popular pieces, Pride and Prejudice and Emma and this sort of thing. Persuasion is the best one, clearly. Read okay. it. Yes. Okay. Well, I've got two weeks' holidays coming up, and I've, um, <laughs> I'm still looking for um, a few books on my list. So. You won't be disappointed. Joanna, describe your perfect afternoon. My perfect afternoon would be um, making apricot jam. <laughs> Very good. And then eating it. Yeah, very good. Um, do you have apricots in where you're from? Uh, yeah, but I would have to say Barasa yeah. apricots are very nice. So, very nice. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? From my mom, this too shall pass. Hmm. And if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Right. Um... Don't try to predict anything that's going to happen in your life because you have absolutely no idea and it's going to be so many surprises along the way. Mm. Just Don't hang on it. for the ride, yeah? Mm.